Well, with, with a name like Thomas Thomas, you quickly uh, go by Tom. Um, I had no idea why, why my parents gave me that name until I, I started looking at genealogy and realized that before my father there were four generations with that, so at least there's been a, a nice spreading of, of the pain of an unusual name. I, I went online, um, you know, the, the beauty of YouTube is to get to look back and see um, all of the individuals that have spoken here at this lecture series, and, and it was both daunting and, and very revealing to me to, uh, to see the wonderful men and women that you've had address you. Um, I've known many of them for, for a long time, and, and I certainly revere them for the accomplishments that they've had, so I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that I can add to this series and bring maybe some insight into some different areas. Um, Rather than, than speak a lot about uh, our company, about Las Vegas, I'll, I'll leave some of that maybe for some questions and answers, but I thought, why not just tackle the single most pressing problem in America today? Got a nice forum, a lot of really bright, intelligent people, so let's go after it. And it, it isn't health care, it isn't the deficit, uh, it's not the inability of our national leaders to get anything done. The single most pressing problem in America today is quite simply that we don't have enough good jobs. And I suspect this is something on all of your minds. Where are the good jobs going to be? When I graduate, where am I going? What am I going to do? And I'm going to treat that subject today in a couple of different ways. Um, first, I would, I would like to suggest uh, maybe some insights from my life, and, and certainly things that you've probably read about. Um, it is intriguing to have lived during the last 50 years in America. Um, all of you would, would certainly understand, um, as you look back on the American story for the past 50 years, that in many key areas of our lives, whether it's medicine, or transportation, or food production, or any energy production. Over the last 50 years, this world has changed more than in the entire preceding span of human existence. And so the question is, how did that happen? Um, certainly, it, it rivals the Industrial Revolution of the early 1900s. And the quick, easy answers, especially for those um, in, in your generation, because you are steeped in technology, is that, well, everything occurred in the last 50 years because of innovation and technology. That was the big difference. Uh, my first real job was working in high school at a, a bank computer center. And I worked in a tape, a computer tape library, working with 10 and a half inch IBM magnetic tapes that would be loaded on a computer the size of a refrigerator, and yet today your iPod can store more data than that IBM mainframe that I used in the banking industry. So you've seen it. I've, I've had the, the blessing of seeing all of this transpire, and it's easy to look back at all of these incredible innovations and recognize how millions upon millions of jobs were created during this span of, of rapid innovation. But today I want to propose that we recognize what might be, at least in my mind, is the key component to creating all of those jobs over the past 50 years. And I'm going to pinpoint a singular type of person, a personality type, an individual type. It's the risk taker. It's the innovator, the pioneer, the people that we refer to by using the French term entrepreneur. Not only do I believe that entrepreneurs are every bit as responsible over the last 50 years of creating this, this innovation and technological miracle, but I would also like to suggest to you that the entrepreneur will be every bit as important over the next 50 years at keeping the American dream going. In fact, um, I would suggest to you that without entrepreneurs, in the American free enterprise system, our lifestyles will change dramatically over what we've known for the past 50 years. 
So I'd like to, to describe to you some basic traits of entrepreneurs, and I'm going to rely upon a, an old, some old stories that I'm going to take for my father, and then I'm going to use some new stories that you'll relate to because the new story I have is all about tech. So 60 years ago, my father, Perry Thomas, left his job as a minor banking executive in Salt Lake City. He worked at the Continental Bank and Trust Company, mergers, acquisitions, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, he was assigned to go to Las Vegas, which at the time was a town of about 50,000 people. So this is in the mid-50s. And he was asked to, to go down there to get involved with a, a small bank. Um, he had to drag my, my mom, somewhat kicking and screaming, from, from Salt Lake, where she had grown up. They had met at the University of Utah following World War II. But he just told her, don't worry, it's for a couple of years. No big deal. They go to, to uh, Las Vegas, and the assignment um, was from my, my father's boss, a man named Walter Cosgriff, who was a Utah and Idaho banking magnate. And uh, Walter said, you go down there, either get this little bank running or get rid of it. So my dad said, okay, it's a couple year assignment. At the time, the banking industry in Las Vegas and in the state of Nevada was dominated by a single bank holding company. It owned two state banks and they controlled 90% of all the banking in the state. And true to form, along with the other banks in the, the state of Nevada, they had a prohibition on any lending to the gaming industry. Now, in Nevada, this wasn't an illegal industry. It was regulated, gaming control board, gaming uh, commissions. But there was a prohibition, and for good reason. At the time, in the mid-50s and into the 60s, the gaming industry had a lot of mob influence. Different aspects of, of gambling were controlled by a couple of families uh, from back east. After being there about a year, my dad um, reported back to his, his boss of conservative Salt Lake-based bankers that a choice had to be made. If this bank was going to survive, then this bank had to make loans to the largest industry in the state of Nevada, which was the resort and gambling industry. And he proposed this to this group of rather conservative bank owners. These guys were pillars in their Catholic, Jewish, and Mormon communities. And I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall and heard the discussion about this, because this is one of those seminal moments in the life of a history, it was certainly a seminal moment in the life of my father, as to whether or not a decision is going to be made. And the first trait I want to, uh, I guess, focus upon, the first trait of entrepreneurs, uh, is that they question the norm. They're not satisfied with the status quo. And they recognize opportunity. In this case, my father was a, a good example of an entrepreneur. He could not let well enough alone. He couldn't accept that the banking industry would basically turn its back on a legalized industry in, in Nevada. So fortunately for him, the owners of this, uh, this bank were also entrepreneurs to a man. And they gave him permission. They did ask him to focus on aspects of the resort and uh, entertainment industry that might not be quite so notorious as the craps tables and roulette. But they gave him permission. And I should mention something about these individuals um, that gave the permission. They were all from the exact same generation, the generation that Tom Brokow has labeled the greatest generation in his book. Each of these men grew up as children of the Depression, and then they were all veterans of World War II. They had seen risk. They had seen uh, difficulty. They had seen a, a country struggle to get through an economic uh, malaise. So they were risk takers themselves, the second trait of entrepreneurs. Not only do they question the norm, but they are risk takers. Maybe careful risk takers, but they are all, always risk takers. So my dad gets this permission. He goes to work, and the first thing that he recognized was that this industry, this industry in infancy, 
needed hotel rooms. How do you run a tourist type of economy without more hotel rooms? So he started looking at how they were going to fund the hotel rooms. At the time, Las Vegas' tallest building was two stories. So for those of you who are familiar with the skyline of Las Vegas today, it's probably a little hard to, to imagine that, two stories. So unfortunately, this little bitty bank had three million in assets. It was called the Bank of Las Vegas. And its lending limit was 50,000 bucks. You can't build a lot of hotel rooms with $50,000. So my dad left Vegas, and he went looking for money. And of course, Vegas was blacklisted in most of the country. And my dad decided he had to figure out a way to get financing that was going to be unusual. And he divided up all the component parts of this industry. It wasn't about craps tables and 21 tables. There was a food and beverage industry. There was an entertainment industry. There was a lodging industry, people wanting to go to the desert. There was even a marriage and divorce industry. And he broke up all these component parts, and as he went around looking for funds, he was able to actually attract it from some pretty conservative places. He found that insurance companies in Texas, which were actually dominated and owned by mainly Baptists, would loan money to build hotel rooms. They did not want to know about tables and the table games. What they were focused on is there's a revenue base to these hotel rooms. They could put a number on that. He also found uh, a, a willing partner in his mentor from the University of Utah and his early mentor in the banking industry, a man named George Eccles. And I know his name doesn't need any uh, additional comment in the state of Utah. George saw what was taking place and he recognized, he was an entrepreneur, he recognized that lending could be given to this industry in a safe, collateralized method. So they found these participating lenders. And this is the third trait that I like to mention of an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs know how to find and create markets for their products or their needs. In my dad's case, had he gone out to the country at large and said, I want you to loan money so we can build casinos in Las Vegas, he would have had zip to utilize. He instead divided this industry up into a cash flow industry that it is, a tourist industry, a resort industry. So he wasn't willing to just stick with the status quo. He had to find a way to take this product and remarket it and then find somebody that was willing to recognize what these component parts were. That's the third trade of entrepreneurs. Once the funding for the expansion of the hotels got underway, my dad and his business friends in the city of Las Vegas recognized that they still had a problem. They still had mob influence in the casinos. It was scattered amongst the different casinos. It was typically very hidden. It was difficult to spot. It probably was one of the reasons that people liked to come to Las Vegas, because they thought they were kind of dealing with this aura, this excitement. We're hanging with the mob. But it was a, a very ugly business, as, as uh, historically um, it's been proven. So my dad had another thought, and he and, and various businessmen knew that they needed to change the, the legal structure of gaming in the state of Nevada. At the time, in order to own any position within a hotel casino, you had to be personally authorized by the Nevada Gaming Control Board, inspections, the whole nine yards. And Obviously, what that eliminated was the whole corporate opportunity for the ownership and the development of the resort industry in the state of Nevada. There's no way you can publicly issue stock and have every single stockholder individually authorized by the State Gaming Control Board. So my dad wanted to change the law. He wanted to allow public corporations to come into Nevada and own and operate these these major uh, casinos. He knew that the minute you did that, you had the catalyst for eliminating the mob. The problem with organized crime is that it does very, very poorly in competing with legal, overt, open-ended businesses. When a corporation can come in and bring to bear its cost of capital and its management talent, illegal operators seem to go by the wayside. 
happens in every business. One of the reasons I think that, that the U.S. is so focused on trying to, to legalize marijuana, they feel that if they can get in there with legal guys running it, it'll eliminate it. But anyway, that's a totally different story. The problem my dad had was a guy named Bill Hera. He owned Hera's Resort in Lake Tahoe. Bill was afraid of the competition from public corporations. And he had so much clout in the northern uh, parts of the state that he basically controlled our legislature. So without him saying yes, that one person saying yes, there was not going to be any change. Eventually, my dad was able to convince Bill that the only way he was going to be able to pass this gaming empire that he had developed onto his children was through the use of a corporation. So my dad kind of created a, a whole new arrangement for Bill's mindset. This, the estate taxes were 50%, kind of like they are now. There was no way Bill was going to pass that estate that he had built up over the years onto his kids unless he took it and through gifting and through mechanisms of, of trust and estate work, he uh, created a, a public corporation. So the minute, literally, that Bill Hera realizes this is the case and now gives his blessing, um, nice thing about small states is governors can do really creative things. The governor called a special session, the laws get changed, and literally within a couple of years, Hilton Corp, Del Webb Corp, other publicly traded companies stepped into the state of Nevada, and you can pinpoint the demise of mob influence in Las Vegas and in the state of Nevada to the allowance of public corporations stepping in and taking control and bringing in MBAs and bringing in all these smart guys to run this business. It was a really neat, uh, a neat event. The fourth trait of entrepreneurs is that they never hear the word no. They only hear not yet. It took probably, I think, uh, I believe it was about five years of discussions with Bill Hera to move this thing forward. And with other gamers, who I'm sure were also concerned about the Hiltons of the world coming in and taking over their industry. But you just don't hear the word no when you're a true entrepreneur. It's always not yet. So those are the four traits from the past. Um, let me tie them now to the present. Over 30 years ago, um, when I was at the College of Business at the University of Utah, there was a formal study that had been conducted by some national economists looking out into the future over the next 30 years, what is going to happen to the U.S. economy? And they were projecting not only what would happen with the U.S. economy, but the other dominant economies. The other two at the time were Germany and Japan. And they looked out 30 years later, and in all of their fact gathering and, and typical economic projections, they decided that Japan would become number one in GDP, followed by Germany and then by the US. And it was largely because of the incredible manufacturing capacity of Japan and, and Germany. We know that did not happen. In fact, we now can look today at those economic projections and see that the United States exceeded them by almost 400%. Today, the United States has a, a gross domestic product, a GDP of $17 trillion, followed by China at about $8 trillion. And then Japan and Germany are distant third and fourth. Why did that happen? Why did they make such a mistake? Let's look at that for a second. I think, again, the, the, the easy answer is innovation and technology, right? But that's it's not like innovation and technology don't take place in Japan and Germany. So that's too easy of an answer. Um, I want to stop right here and just mention three books that basically contain some of the information that I'm, I'm giving to you and, and really shaped my thinking on this subject that I'm going to talk about right now. The first one is called The Coming Jobs War by Jim Clifton. Uh, Mr. Clifton's the CEO of the Gallup organization, the largest polling organization on the planet, The Coming Jobs War. Very important read if you're uh, in business school right now. The second one is The Smartest Kids in the World by Amanda Ripley. And the third book is called Big Data by Victor uh, Mayer Schoenberger and Kenneth Kukie. So 
The Coming Jobs War, the smartest kids in the world, big data. That's your homework assignment to at least consider looking at these books. And I know you guys get a lot of information from blogs. These aren't reads. These are really studies. You've got to pick these books up and study them because I think it might shape your thinking for what's going to take place over the next 10, 20 years in our country. Let me get back to the question. Why were these economists so wrong about the future of the U.S. economy? And I've already mentioned um, the easy gas, innovation, and technology. There was no way for these economists 30 years ago to foresee the Microsoft, Dell, Oracle, HP, Apple, Amazon, Google, eBay, the list goes on and on. Every one of these companies coming out of the United States, every one of these companies transforming technology, and every one of these companies making available the opportunity for literally millions and millions of jobs to be created in this country. And yes, it did affect other countries, but not in any way, shape, or form like the gross domestic product of the United States. American technology was the engine, but the fuel is what I'm going to return to again. The fuel was the entrepreneur. Because all of that innovation, all of that technology is just a great idea sitting on a shelf without the entrepreneur to take it to market, to get it to the buyer, to get it funded. Just as we oftentimes see history repeat itself in areas of politics and, and conflict, we'll see the exact same thing. Unless the entrepreneur leads the American free enterprise system forward, by doing exactly what's been done in the past. We're not going to create the jobs. We just won't create the jobs that need to be created in this country. So I mentioned um, this idea that the most pressing problem that we have in America is good jobs. Interestingly enough, the Gallup organization found that that was the same thing worldwide. Years ago, uh, Gallup looked at what were the most pressing needs. What, what did people really, really want? And we're looking back 20, 30 years ago. And you could guess. If, if I took a poll of you, you'd get them. Absolutely get them. They were money, food, shelter, peace, freedom, and safety. You polled the whole world, different people, different places, different economic levels of, of creation. That was it. Money. Food, shelter, safety, peace, and freedom. The Gallup uh, organization has been doing a poll over the last um, eight years asking that exact same question all over the world. Young people, old people, asking people involved in pit politics, people that are completely apolitical because they, they have no voice. And wherever they're asking that question, they're finding the same answer. The one biggest desire of the world today is a good job. A job that is about 30 hours or more per week and is consistent every single week. Gallup estimates that there's 1.8 billion good jobs in the world today, serving 7 billion people. And if we're going to maintain economic, political, and social harmony in this world, we need to more than double. We need to get to 3 billion good jobs how is that going to take place? How is that going to happen? The, um, the thing that I think we, we need to consider um, in America today when we look at job creation is that we are really at a crossroads. And we say that about so many things in America. Everything's at a crossroads. Our health care is at a crossroads. Our political system's at a crossroads. Our energy and the use of energy and climate change, we're all at a crossroads. But I really would like to emphasize that unless the job growth comes through the entrepreneurial model, which is the creation of small businesses and medium-sized businesses, where most jobs are literally created, new jobs, not just the expansion of an existing company like an IBM or a Dell, but new jobs, robust jobs, the jobs that you see taking place in technology, and to emphasize that, I'm going to now take an entrepreneurial spin into the present. And I'm going to talk about big data. I mentioned uh, the, the book, Big Data. And you guys probably understand big data more than most because there's a, a pretty serious enterprise not too far from your campus 
of big data that's causing a little bit of a stir nationally about the invasion of privacy. Um, that massive data center um, is, is collecting huge amounts of data and it is completely dwarfed by the data that's being collected on each of you individually by Google and by eBay and through PayPal and all of your habits as you sit on your systems and you tweet and you Facebook and all of that data that's being collected on you completely dwarfs anything that the federal government is doing. Um, when I was in college, I was amazed that I could get a computer that would store a megabyte of information, right? And now your world is no longer gigabytes, it's now terabytes. And now you're talking petabytes. And pretty soon you're going to all be looking for a system that can handle exabytes. And it goes on and on and on. Um, I've always been amazed by what these, we throw out these terms like terabytes, and I'm amazed by what it really comes down to. Um, let me throw out just what, what we're dealing with. The entire collection of the U.S. Library of Congress, which is equal to the amount of paper that's produced by 500,000 trees, can be stored on 10 terabytes of storage. 10 terabytes. And one petabyte is 1,024 terabytes. So let's talk about petabytes, because that's kind of where we are now. One petabyte is 20 million four-drawer filing cabinets filled with text. One petabyte of information. If you take all of the written works of mankind from the beginning of recorded history in all languages, it's 50 petabytes of information. Okay? Big number, right? 50 petabytes. Google is processing more than 24 petabytes of information a day right now. So if you think there's a lot of information out there that the government's gathering, think of one half of all the written works of mankind in all languages being processed every single day by one company, Google. So Google, uh, or, or the, the, when we think of giga and tera and peta and X and all these things, we're talking about massive amounts of data and it all has to end up someplace. It all ends up being stored someplace. So let me now talk about the entrepreneurial game that I've seen going on with a, a small startup company in Las Vegas called Switch. Over the past 13 years, I've been involved with this, uh, with this data storage company. It started off with a single guy, a guy named Rob Roy. He built a little 3,000 square foot data center in a strip mall, a little retail shopping center. It was sandwiched between a barber shop and a fast food joint. And he started this little business. And naturally, like most startups, it wasn't profitable to begin with. But Rob was an unusual guy. He was the consummate entrepreneur. He never accepted the norm. He constantly was looking at what's wrong with, with the business model of data centers and questioning how to make it, uh, make it grow and more profitable. When I met Rob, he was about 30, um, so this is around 2000. He didn't have a college degree in computer science or engineering or in business. Um, he had actually left college to go and pursue what he wanted to do. And I am not suggesting that this is the model. Um, get education, get all the education you can get, and continue, getting it, continue, continue to get education as much as you can. But Rob was one of those uh, unique individuals that was just naturally self-taught in his field. And so uh, he, he kind of had that quality that you don't necessarily teach somebody. He was just inherently... Uh, in, intuitive, he was inherently curious about every single thing that he saw, and he was a risk taker. So he had that, that, that great uh, trait of entrepreneurs. When he started his company, the typical data center world was all built with a, a raised floor model. And for all of you that have, have ever seen a, a data center, you know what I'm talking about. They started um, years ago by bringing the floor up a, a foot, foot and a half, the cabling, the power, and then the cold air would run under the floorboards, come up through perforated tiles, and all of that cold air coming into the data center would cool the compute. 
Um, and as the computing needs became more robust, the raised floor got higher and higher and higher. In some data centers, it's now three and a half feet off the ground, just so that they can get all of the compute in there. Rob challenged that. He said, this is nonsense. He understood Moore's law, which suggests that every 18 to 24 months, the computing capacity of microchips doubles. And, and we've certainly seen Moore's law proven um, over the last number of years. He also knew that um, this, this doubling of computer capacity or, or data capacity within these microchips would also double the heat output. And it would double the amount of connectivity that they would need for processing. Everything would get to the point that that little raised floor would no longer work. He also understood a very basic concept, cold air falls, hot air rises. And so he turned the whole thing around and he put all the cooling, just like it is in most homes, above the systems. He completely just revamped the idea of what a data center should be. And he redesigned and he redesigned and he redesigned. He displayed basically that first trait that I mentioned. He was constantly questioning the norm. And then he went on and, and, uh, and decided that he needed to grow his company, so he reached out to other entrepreneurs. He had to find the funding, just like my dad did for those hotel rooms. Rob had to find the funding for his dreams. We built his first ground-up data center, 50,000 square foot data center in Las Vegas, and that data center became the incubator for Rob's design dreams. Throughout that, that entire 50,000 square feet, you can literally walk and about every 20 feet you see something new take place. And there's a redesign and a redesign. By the time you get to the top floor of this two-story building, it's a completely different model. You see an evolution of over, over two years. So Rob possessed that second trait of entrepreneurs. He was able to go out and find these risk takers that would join him and help fund what he needed to do. Um, that that 50,000 square foot building, this incubator, was the model to then do another one. We're going to do another 50,000 square foot computer. And Rob sat back and thought, well, does that make a lot of sense? It takes a lot of time and effort to develop 50,000 square foot data centers one after another. All of the infrastructure, all of the, the mind-blowing um, time and energy spent with county commissions and city councils and planners and inspectors and all this. Rob said, why don't we build six of those all at one time? Let's build a big warehouse and we'll just throw six 50,000 square foot data centers inside this big warehouse and we'll just build it as we need to. Build it as they come. And again, he had to convince other risk takers to, to go with that model. And uh, our company was uh, involved with Rob in doing a 400,000 square foot supercomputing data center in Las Vegas. Um, we projected it would take six years to fill the computer center. It took four. Um, and the clients are the Fortune 50 of the tech world. And that gets into Rob's third trait of being a successful entrepreneur. He, he knew how to deliver the idea to the market. He didn't spend one dollar on marketing. He didn't go to journals. He didn't go to, new, he didn't go to any of the, the typical ways that you market tech. He went to the user. He went to the engineers. His designs made engineers look really good. He could cool any kind of technology because of these designs he came up with. And over the period of time, he developed this uh, history of 100% uptime. Not a picosecond of down, you know, not two or three minutes during a year, because that doesn't help much if you're eBay. Two minutes of downtime when it takes 24 hours to recycle all of your compute and bring your systems back up is a very bad day for eBay. He's been 100% up. The engineers love that. Who wouldn't? He made every engineer look good. They bring their, their tech into a switch data center. They never go down. They've got wonderful redundancy. They've got all this, this connectivity, very efficient. They make the engineers look great. And word of mouth has sold every bit of the switch data centers to this big economy. 
It's a, it's a very interesting model, looking for who the real customer is. It wasn't the CIO of the company. It wasn't the CFO of the company. It wasn't the CEO. It was literally the guy that has to install and whose life is on the line if the systems goes down. The final and the fourth trait of, of an entrepreneur that, that Rob Roy displayed is you never hear the word no. You only hear not yet. You can imagine a, a young startup company that's going to be consuming huge amounts of power going to the local power company and saying, I need you to set aside about a third of that substation of power for the next four or five years because I'm going to build a data center and it's going to use every bit of that. And naturally, the power company executives pat you on the head and say, we're the, we're the engineers. We understand this stuff. Your projections are way off. Rob's projections weren't way off. That 400,000 square foot supercomputing data center is designed to accept 100 megs of power. And to put that into perspective, that's the amount of power that is utilized by the Venetian Hotel, the Bellagio Hotel, and the Wynn and the Encore Hotel combined. And that would all go into one data center. So you can see why Rob is being patted on the head and told, you're out of your mind. No data center could ever utilize that much power. Today in America, 10% of all of the power that is produced in America is being consumed by keeping all of our data stored, running, organized, moving, buying on the internet, all that stuff. That's 10% of our power. In 25 years, it's predicted that it will be 50% of all of the power generated in America. Big numbers. So that was Rob's not yet moment. He just kept going back and going back and building the data centers and creating them and expanding them. And before you know it, he actually got there. Now he's one of the largest consumers of power of NV Energy. And he calls any executive he wants and chats with them about what the future of tech is. So the story really of, of these two different entrepreneurial sets is looking at, at the, the past 50 years and, and Rob's model is looking at the next 50 years. Um, certainly both of the individuals involved, my father and, and Rob Roy were innovators, they were risk takers and they found other innovators and risk takers and they built teams around them of innovators and risk takers. The concept that, that I feel is most important for us to understand today that um, entrepreneurs in America drove this last 50 years of economic miracle of GDP growth. Um, the Michael Dells, the Stephen Jobs, the Bill Gates. You look at every single icon of technology and you'll find every single trait that we've talked about. But they had to operate in a free enterprise system that was unfettered from the constraints of overzealous government regulation, of basically taking ideas and saying, we don't think we can push those ideas forward. That might, that might allow those people there to create something that could really get a little bit out of control. They might create a technology that literally can house 400 million products at one time in one company, like eBay does today. Our generation was the, the, the generation that, that uh, my generation was the generation that kind of looked out and said, if it's possible, let's go for it. Let's see what happens. Your generation is going to be the generation that now fuels what has been given to you, this technological data set, this incredible opportunity to take the 24 petabytes of processing that occurs every day in Google and transform a world in which medical innovation, new ways of food processing, better use of energy and efficiency, are, will create jobs that none of you even know of because they don't exist today. Most of you are probably going to be working in industries in seven years, eight years from now that don't exist today, doing things that nobody had thought of. That's how fast technology is moving. And I think it's exciting. I think it's exciting, but I also think it's, it's very sobering because we have, to be, uh, we have to have a mindset of guarding against the day-to-day the 
whittling away of the free enterprise system, a system that allows for open funding, allows for an entrepreneur to go out and reach out and find the types of, of dollars that are necessary, a system that allows somebody to invent something and try it out and beta test it and work on it without having some form of government regulation come in and say, oh, no, 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 we can't have you be doing that. We're, we're not even sure what the impact of that could be, so we're not gonna have you doing that. That's what we have to guard against. I'm, uh, I'm a big believer, obviously, in, in, uh, in free enterprise. Um, Vegas is kind of a model of it. When you look at the companies that were built there um, that are now the, the largest gaming and resort enterprises in the world, um, enterprises built by guys like Steve Wynn or Sheldon Adelson, they follow the entrepreneurial model. They follow the pre-enterprise -enter, uh, model. And I guess my, my last thought is if we don't maintain this same free enterprise system that got us to where we are today, um, I would suggest that America will lose its economic edge. I would suggest that, that um, to some degree, um, each of you will be looking at a different model than I got to look at when I was putting my company together and reaching out and doing fun things and exciting things in an entrepreneurial mindset. And I hope that, that if there's any message I leave behind is that uh, you're aware of this. You have to look out and you have to guard um, against those, those um, impediments that might recondition the American free enterprise model. Thank you very much. And I believe we have three minutes for questions and answers before you all run off to class. So, if any questions about, uh, yeah, go right ahead. So, as Jennifer and I've been looking to go to work for myself, how has the legal training helped you in an entrepreneurial venture? It, it, it's interesting. I did not go to law school to become a typical attorney. I, I went to, uh, to the U's finance um, department to get training in banking. That was going to be my big career. And then when I told my dad, hey, I'm graduating. I want to come to work with you in the bank. He said, that's great. If you want to be a banker, you've got to go to law school. So I, I, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of law schools, not because we need more lawyers. I'm a fan of law schools because um, it's, it's a conditioning exercise in how to think in a different methodology. And I think learning that mindset, that thinking process that you learn through the case methodology and the different methodologies that most law schools use. Um, it, it's a very um, good preparation for almost any business model. Now that said, my, my son, who's over at, at the Y, is to studying computer science, not, and he's not going to law school, so I had a little talk with him about where he should put some emphasis too. But, but personally, I think if, if you've got a mindset you want to get into, um, into any business venture, and you have a desire to go through the process of, of law school, it's an excellent education for any business that you want to get into. Yeah. Yes. No, that's, I mean, that's a great question. The question was um, looking at, at the future of, of food production and the needs of, of a world that has limited water, um, limited facilities. Um, it's interesting because there's some startup companies in Las Vegas um, that are doing hydroponics and aquaponics. And they're now the favored um, source for the top chefs in the casino industry because they're right there and they're producing herbs and greens and they're so fresh and through the hydroponic methodology they can determine exactly what kind of nutrients are, are going into it that that you've got these uh, world famous chefs and that's who they're buying from 
So it's a neat startup model. I mean, personally, I think you still go through universities. You go to, you know, great agricultural universities like Utah State and, and UC Davis and places. Um, universities oftentimes are the locale for the first funding because the, the guys with money want to go to the incubation of, of, a, of the university laboratory because they can oftentimes vet it easier there than if you just go out and sit down with somebody in their office. They can go talk to the professors. They can see the models that you're using at universities. So the university system is actually now becoming a venture capitalist haven for funding because the vetting process is easier. Any other questions? Very good, well thank you, I appreciate it, and great to be with you.